I'm actually the token Lutheran here at Answers in Genesis. I'm outnumbered by Baptists, I think 340 to 1. <laughs> but I'm, I want you to know that I'm very, <laughs> very charitable with my Baptist colleagues here. I assure them that you do not have to be a Lutheran to be saved. But why take the chance? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a pleasure uh, to be here this morning and talk to you about uh, that wonderful subject, uh, the birth of a, of a child. Anyone who's ever experienced that, I don't have to convince you, this is probably the most stunning experience we ever see in life. And uh, I put together a lecture some years ago, it's been modified a few times, perhaps some of you have seen earlier versions of the lecture, but I call it Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. You know I stole that title from the Bible, right? I think it's okay to steal from the Bible if you give credit and that sort of thing. You know, one question we hear a lot regarding the, the baby developing the womb is, when does life begin in the womb? Well, I got news for you. Life doesn't really begin in the womb, if by alive you mean when are things alive? I mean the womb is alive, the mother is alive, the sperm cells are alive, the egg cell is alive. What question are we asking when we ask when does life begin in the womb? I really think we're asking when does a human person uh, begin in the womb? And uh, there uh, we run into an interesting question because you see God created human beings on the sixth day of, of creation. And life has been a continuum ever since that, hasn't it? Life begets life. That's one of the basic axioms of biology. All life comes from pre-existing life. life. Give you a harder one. All cells come from previously existing cells. You know, nobody's ever seen an exception. And all humans come from previously existing humans, humans except the first one, which was created. That was the beginning. And life's been a continuum since then, and if it ever stopped for 10 minutes, we'd never get it started again. So when we ask, when does a person begin in the womb, that presents some challenges too, because uh, look at here, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, the Lord says of his prophet Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Obviously, we can't think of that time before the worlds were formed when the Lord knew us and called us according to his purpose. We have to go by what we can see. And as we'll see in the course of this particular lecture, uh, the very first moment of a genetically distinct person on this earth is fertilization. There is no other unambiguous point we can put our finger on. Well, uh, we have to give the Lord credit for uh, forming our body in the womb. Jerem or Psalm 139 uh, says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. We hear that word knit, don't we, in Scripture. And it's an apt description of what the Lord is doing in there. Of course, it's anthropomorphic. We think of God knitting away. First of all, I'd say, if the Lord is knitting, do not snatch the knitting out of his hands. <laughs> and knitting is not just... Uh, a kind of an anthropomorphic term, our body really is knit. Uh, my field of expertise is called histology. I was the histology editor for Stedman's Medical Dictionary, and I was course master of histology at Washington University School of Medicine. The name histology comes from a Greek word, histos. It means a web or a fabric. Hey, I'm an expert on webs and fabrics. Huh? And what on earth are we doing teaching about webs and fabrics in a medical school? That's the name given to looking through the microscope at, for example, a human body. And why do we call it the study of webs and fabrics? Because everything looks woven in the body. Connective tissue fibers of the dermis are woven in a way so complicated the leather industry's never really figured it out. How can our dermis be made from fibers that are less elastic than steel and yet be so stretchy? It's because of the weave, like a double-knit suit. And unlike a piece of fabric where you have a warp and a woof and so the mechanics of the fabric are just one way and that's fixed, the fabric of our body, the weave varies so that the elasticity is different at the elbow and in this side of the arm and this side of the arm. 
It's a continuous seamless fabric with a different weave at each point to give it just the proper biomechanics. I always tell people, our body is so woven, you might actually think we were knit together in our mother's womb. <laughs> and, and, and when I say that here at the museum, some people look at me and, you know, no, they don't catch it because they, they're not that familiar <laughs> with that verse. <laughs> Others, boy, the light bulb comes right on. Yeah, the Lord knit us together in our mother's womb. I praise you. Why do we praise God? Well, for one thing, we praise him because we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and I know that full well. I could imagine some modern version of the Bible called what? The hip version, you know, very modern language, would go, your works are wonderful, and that's like a no-brainer. <laughs> I mean, it's just plain, duh. <laughs> In fact, the Bible tells us the only way to get around it is just actually to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. It's not a matter of not believing. You have to take what you already know that God himself has revealed. He's made it evident to us, the scripture says. From the beginning of the world, we have to take that and suppress it to not believe it. As Psalm 139 goes on to say, My frame, basically my skeleton, was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. Uh, the secret place would, of course, be the womb. And it's kind of a euphemism for the womb because at the time of the Psalms, at least the people who read this knew a little less about what was going on in the womb than we do, although they knew babies were developing in something we call the womb or uterus today. And uh, a good name for it was a secret place. A lot of marvelous secrets are going on there. When I was woven, there it is again, together in the depths of the earth, another euphemism for the womb is like planting a seed in the soil and it would grow. And then your eyes, that is God's eyes, saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Well, before we dive in and start looking at the biology of the first week of development uh, in the, bo in the bo baby, uh, we should, uh, I think, uh, uh, get sobered a bit by looking at Ecclesiastes. You know, when I taught at the medical school, I'd have to read the book of Ecclesiastes on a regular basis just to keep from getting a big hit. Uh, Ecclesiastes has a way of really taking the wind out of your sails. He says, there's nothing new under the sun. He says, of the making of books, there is no end, and with much study is wearisome to the flesh. And then he says, with much learning comes much grief. He who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Boy, that's not a very optimistic <laughs> kickoff, is it, for looking at the development? Because here he says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 11, verse 5, As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. So let's not get the idea we're going to be explaining things here. We're just going to look at a little bit more of the glory of what's going on. Well, there it is. That's that a secret place. The uterus sets low uh, in the uh, body, very low in the uh, lower abdomen. And uh, it's held in place. It's a remarkably small organ when it's not gravid or a baby isn't developing in it. And it's held in position, kind of leaning forward like this, uh, by a broad ligament on each side, which has been given a clever name, the broad ligament. <laughs> I'm not going too fast, am I? No, I don't think so. You might want to take a guess at what we call the uh, round ligament that you see coming in here that holds the ovaries in place. You've heard this lecture before. <laughs> Uh, we have a pair of ovaries, and then coming out of the uterus is a pair of oviducts, egg tubes, one for each ovary. And the ovaries are where the eggs are developing. And at about the age of 15 or so, they'll begin to uh, ovulate. And uh, they ovulate about, uh, well, if you're right on schedule, about every 28 days. And they're courteous. They take turns, right, left, right, left, sort of like that. But if one of the ovaries is destroyed or dysfunctional, uh, the remaining ovary has a considerable good sense to then just go ahead and ovulate every 28 days. So you still get the regular ovulation. Uh, the end of the oviduct ends in a funnel, as you can see here. It has a curious name. It's called the funnel. 
uh, only in Latin, the infundibulum. It means the funnel, but if we just called it the funnel, you'd all understand what we meant. You wouldn't think we're that smart, but infundibulum, that sounds pretty good. And a funnel does what you'd expect funnels to do. It catches things so they don't get spilled over. So when the egg is released from the ovary, it goes into this infundibulum or funnel, and it doesn't take any chances. It just goes right down on the ovary and moves around until it senses where the egg is going to come and parks right there. You can hardly miss, sort of like the baseball catcher going out to the pitcher's mound, putting the glove over the pitcher's hand and say, let her fly. <laughs> and even then, it can occasionally miss the oviduct and becomes a medical emergency as an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, let's look at one of those uh, ovaries. Uh, how, how big are they? They're about the size of an almond nut, so you could see it with the unaided eye. You wouldn't need a microscope. And uh, we'll kind of magnify it uh, and look at it in cross-section in this illustration from Netter. And uh, it's interesting. When a baby girl is born, she has all of the eggs or oocytes that she's ever going to have in her whole life, about 400,000, nearly half a million eggs. And then uh, when she reaches reproductive age, about every 28 days, 30 to 40 of these uh, nearly half a million eggs will begin to develop. And you see them developing up here. I'll point to this screen, but you can see over there the same thing. Uh, and as they develop, they become larger. And uh, the egg is just a little uh, part in the center here. This is a fluid that builds inside, so we call it a follicle. Uh, the biggest follicle is often called a graphian follicle. Typically only one ovulates, so occasionally two or more, and that's how you get non-identical uh, twins. It could be a boy and a girl. It's two different eggs, two different sperm. Uh, all of the rest of the follicles that started to develop go into what we call atresia. They just break down. So you get one successor that uh, ovulates. Estimated that in the reproductive lifespan of a typical female, uh, about 450 to 500 of these ova would ovulate. Apparently the Lord figured 500 kids was enough for anyone. Uh, talk about the old lady that lived in a shoe, is a whole different category. Uh, when the egg is ovulated, of course, pregnancy may or may not occur, uh, but the ovary goes ahead and, and starts developing an endocrine gland. You see this yellow body here, which has been called the yellow body. Only in Latin, corpus luteum, which means the yellow body. Uh, it produces progesterone and uh, other substances that prepare the uterus, get it ready to receive the baby should fertilization occur. Uh, if fertilization occurs, it becomes a very large organ. In most cases, at least two or four centimeters across anyway. So you can take a microscope slide, hold it at arm's length, and see this endocrine gland. Uh, it's really big. And if pregnancy doesn't occur, it breaks down, realizes it's not needed, and uh, shuts everything down. When it shuts everything down, it becomes a white body, which of course is called the white body, or corpus albicans. And that is a scar. So like any scar you may have in your body, you'll notice it's not very well vascularized. It's kind of white looking, it's just mostly connective tissue. And if you notice scars don't go away, you pretty much get them for life. Not here. If that were the case here, it would be the end of life that reproduces this way, certainly uh, human life. Why so? This scar is so big. Remember, the whole ovary is the size of an almond nut. This scar is so big, you can hold a microscope slide at arm's length. You don't need a microscope, and you can see the scar. And every 28 days, you get another one. What do you figure? Four or five months, your ovary is a solid mass of scar tissue and of life. But what does the Lord do? Oh, this is so wonderful, I should charge you $5 a piece extra just to share this with you. <laughs> the only place in the body where scar is absolutely dissolved away into nothing. If I were an evolutionist and saw that, I'd go, that was close. We could have lost it right there, just for failing to get rid of the scars from the old corpus luteum. Well, let's uh, move on. Here's a cross-section through the whole system, uterus, oviduct, ovary. And, uh, of course, the sperm have to find their way uh, to the proper uh, tube here. Like all males, they don't ask questions, so a lot of them get lost. <laughs> the egg is released into the first third of the oviduct. 
and that's pretty much mechanical. It's ejected out under uh, hydraulic pressure, you might say, and uh, it lands right about in here. And that's typically where fertilization would occur if it's going to occur. The important thing is if fertilization occurs, it starts developing right away and dividing, and you need to hustle it on down the oviduct to get it to the uterus where it implants. Uh, what moves the egg, or not the egg anymore, if it were fertilized, we'll call that the zygote or the conceptus. Uh, what moves it is, if you look at the wall uh, of the oviduct, it's lined with tall cells that look like this. And they have these little hairs on the end. They're much tinier than a hair. They're so tiny that if there was just one of them up there, you wouldn't see it in the light microscope. You need an electron microscope. But collectively, you can see them just like I could see here on some people's heads in the back of the room. Uh, and unlike hair, these things move, sort of like Medusa's hair. Huh? And they don't move like an oar, they move like a whip, like this, okay? And their function is to propel the egg down the oviduct uh, to the uh, uterus. Uh, should they fail to do this, every pregnancy would be a tubal pregnancy. It would implant right there in the oviduct. If you know about tubal pregnancies, you're going to add cilia to your prayer list. Finally, Lord, thank you for cilia, without which all pregnancies would be a tubal pregnancy, would be the end of life. How do the cilia beat to move the egg down the oviduct? They can't all just sit there and go like this, you know, beating to their own little tempo. Uh, that would not move the egg down the oviduct. Uh, they can't move like window wipers in a car, you know, everything left, right, left. That's not going to work. There's only one movement that works, and it's this movement right here. And you've all seen it before. It's called the wave. <laughs> Been to a ball game where they do the wave? This is it. A uh, scientific name for this particular motion is a metachronal rhythm. There is no other known motion by motile cilia, no one, that could move the conceptus or uh, the uh, uh, zygote down the oviduct. You have to beat in that way. You see the same motion when you see wind blow across the wheat field. Well, here we are. This is the whole week of what goes on and th that we'll be talking about. Uh, the egg has arrived uh, in the oviduct, and uh, when it got ejected from its follicle, it didn't come out clean. It came out with some uh, cells that accumulate around the egg. Here is the egg. It's about the size of a grain of salt, so you could just make this out uh, with the human eye. This is the largest cell in the human body that's not a syncytium. A syncytium is when you get a lot of separate cells and fuse them together. They can get huge, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, but for a cell, it just has a, one set of chromosomes, one nucleus. This is huge, and the sperm is about the smallest cell in the human body, so the smallest cell has to work with the biggest cell. These cells that accumulate around the egg, which are cleverly called the cells that accumulate around the egg, <laughs> only in Latin, the cumulus oophorus, uh, these cells are important. Why? Well, you see the cilia are out here lining this uh, tube. This is a cross-section of the oviduct, and this cross-section just happened to hit this egg. Can you imagine the chances of that? Uh, this was in one of my medical students' uh, slide sets, and he called me over to ask a question. I took one look at that, and I said, that slide doesn't belong to you, that belongs to me. <laughs> so I took it away and gave him a slide. This was oviduct without an egg in it. Uh, but to catch it uh, is pretty amazing, and if we magnify it, you see, we not only caught the egg cell in this plane of section, but we caught the chromosomes of the egg in a metaphase plate viewed edge on. Would you mind if I just sort of stood up here and gloated over this picture for a while? <laughs> uh, this, by the way, if you're familiar with what's going on here, this is at the metaphase stage of the second meiotic division, because we have meiosis that occurs here in these eggs, as in the sperm. It reduces the number of chromosomes to half, is what it really amounts to. And uh, it'll complete that first meiotic division at the time, or it'll be, go up to the first meiotic division at the time of ovulation, but it will not complete that division in most cases unless fertilization occurs. Then it completes it and we get the fertilization event. By the way, this clear zone around the egg, which you can obviously guess is called the clear zone around the egg, uh, the zona pellucida, is the eggshell of the human body. Did you know we had an eggshell? 
Yeah, it's not like in a chicken. It's not mineralized. It's like a gel. And as you'll see in a moment, it's, it's important, like everything. Nothing's up here for show. Even these raggy-looking cells, I you think, could you have cleaned this thing off a little bit? Turns out that those cumulus cells are important. They secrete a sticky substance that the cilia get purchase on to move the egg down the oviduct. It's been shown experimentally, for example, in rabbit eggs, that if you remove the cumulus and just put the bare egg in the oviduct, it doesn't go down the oviduct. It just sits there and spins. Again, if I were an evolutionist, I'd go, that was close. We could have lost it right there just by not having the cumulus and the corona radiata. Well, let's go uh, to the next stage. Uh, fertilization uh, typically occurs in about this time range, 12 to 24 hours after ovulation. And uh, uh, here is uh, basically what's going on there. Uh, this is a drawing of the egg. The red would be that clear zone, the zone of Pellucida. Out of the 150 million sperm that were available at this time, uh, only a couple dozen will actually find it, its way to the oviduct. They home in by heat seeking and by chemical attractions once it gets close uh, to the uh, egg. The sperm adhere to the wall of the oviduct, and this is very important. They have to be capacitated. You just can't take a sperm and fertilize an egg, even uh, in, uh, in uh, doing this in vitro outside of the body. It has to be exposed to the female reproductive system, the oviduct, because there's some chemical reactions that go on there called capacitation. No capacitation, no fertilization. So after they've been capacitated, it's very important that out of the dozen or so sperm that might be in the vicinity, only one fertilize the egg. If more than one fertilizes, we call that polyspermy, the whole thing immediately breaks down. So how do we keep uh, a couple of dozen competing sperm who kind of circle in figure eights around the uh, egg? Uh, how is it only one is allowed to fertilize? Well, they have to work their way through the cumulus, the sticky material here, and that requires a special enzyme to get through. Otherwise, there would be no fertilization. If you're an evolutionist, you should be going again. When they reach the zone of Pellucida, there's no way they're getting through that, except it produces a specific uh, enzyme uh, that uh, called acrosin that manages to burrow its way through the otherwise unimpenetrable zona pellucida and finally the sperm is down here and touches the egg cell membrane. A quick inventory is done by the egg that basically involves are you a sperm cell? Are you a human cell? Have you been capacitated? The answer to all these questions is yes. The egg basically says come on in. Now what about the other sperm? As soon as the very first sperm touches the cell membrane, there's a special reaction uh, where a bunch of little granules called acrosomal gran or, uh, uh, cortical granules burst. They release an enzyme called ovoperoxidase that hardens the eggshell. So all the other sperm get stopped right in their tracks. It, it's called dumb luck. <laughs> no, it isn't. It, it's absolutely impossible to look at this and believe this could happen. It's impossible unless you actively suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Well, uh, let's say the sperm gets in, you'd think, well, that's fertilization. No, nope, not quite yet. Uh, this is a cross-section through a human uh, egg. And in this case, we're seeing two structures called the pronuclei here in this electron micrograph. They're easily identifiable by the PNs that appear on them. Each of these is a membrane-enclosed structure that contains the chromosomes either from mother or father. As you know, you get a double set of chromosomes. So each of those would contain 23 chromosomes. You say 23, we're supposed to have 46. Now remember, meiosis halves the number of chromosomes. Why is that important? Let's say it didn't happen. Let's say the egg has 46 chromosomes and the sperm has 46 chromosomes. And they get together, how many chromosomes do you have now? 92. And the next time it happens, you double again. So very key, you have to have the number. And then when the sperm, and, or the male and the female pronuclei fuse, that's fertilization or conception. At least it used to be. Maybe not anymore. Uh, embryologists uh, have in the past been in agreement on this. The, from uh, Ronan O'Reilly and Mueller, uh, they say in their embryology book, although life is a continuous process, we mentioned that, 
Fertilization is a critical landmark because under ordinary circumstances, a new genetically distinct human organism is formed when the chromosome of the male and the female pronuclei blend. So when those two pronuclei blend, <laughs> that's it. If you keep your fingers off, it just progresses then. A uh, baby emerges nine months later. Well, that isn't what conception is anymore. It's been redefined, partly by our federal government. I was uh, an editor for Stedman's Medical Dictionary at the time of this dictionary, 26th edition, 1995. I was in charge of all of the definitions that related to histology. I was not in charge of the definition for conception. It was probably somebody in obstetrics and gynecology. But in the 26th edition, 1995, conception was defined as the act of conceiving or becoming pregnant, fertilization of the oocyte or ovum by a spermatozoan to form a visible zygote. That would be fertilization or conception. They'd be synonyms. The very next edition in 2000, they changed that. Uh, what did they change? They took out that part and they brought in this. Now conception is the implantation of the blastocyte in the endometrium. I'll show you what that involves in a bit, but just for starters, it's a completely erroneous definition. It is not the blastocyte that implants. It's the blastocyst, which is made up of many separate blastocytes, but uh, if you're going to totally ruin a definition to become meaningless, then who cares if the terms within it are meaningless? Uh, I'll uh, show you why this is important in a bit. Behold, the Bible says, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. This is King David after he'd done that monstrous thing of uh, impregnating his general's wife and then tried to cover it up. Uh, when he could see that it was difficult to cover up, uh, he arranged to have him placed in a position in battle where he was sure to be killed, and he was. And then he took his general's wife. This was called to his attention by the prophet. And King David said this prayer, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. That means I was lifted out of the womb already, a sinner. He says, And in sin my mother conceived me. It doesn't mean his mother was a sinner for having a baby. He was a sinner from the get-go. Well, let's look at uh, what's happening here uh, as we approach implantation. At 30 hours after ovulation, if fertilization occurs, you will have the first two cells that's going to make the baby. This is probably the youngest human being here you've ever seen. This is a two-cell stage of a human. And the little band you see going around here, that's the eggshell, the zona pellucida. Uh, here's something so amazing that you might want to plug your ears, because if you hear this, you probably may not get sleep tonight. But if that zona pellucida is not intact and solid, these eggs can separate, or these cells are not eggs, they're two cells of the developing baby. The reason they can separate is later on in life, or later on in development, even in the embryo, the cells start binding together with junctions called desmosomes and intercellular cements and what have you, uh, uh, binding proteins. That's why you can take your hand and do this, you don't just have cells fly off on the floor. Uh, they stick together, but at this early stage, you take away the zona pellucida, they can drift apart. And if they drift apart, you don't get one human being, you get two. There are even occasions of three and four, approximately one in a million births are, are, are get three in this way, and much rarer uh, quads. We call these identical twins. They're a virtual clone. They came from what was going to form one human being, but it split and it made two. Uh, we'd call this a clone. A lot of people say, would a clone be a monster? Uh, well, here's a clone right here. These two young ladies are identical twins. Wonderful Christian women have been a great help to me in the Creation Museum here. Uh, so uh, that's an identical twin, different from the fraternal twin, which would be two separate eggs, two separate sperm. Could be male and female. Here they have to be the same sex. And by the way, they have different fingerprints. There's more going on here than just genes beginning to appreciate epigenetic phenomena. Well, uh, let's move to three days. Now you notice we've had more divisions. There's more cells here. Uh, we call this a morula. 
And uh, Moriola basically is a scientific name for raspberry, because this thing looks like a kind of a microscopic raspberry. You get further division. At four days, this little ball of cells of Moriola is definitely into the uterus. And if we look at uh, these stages here from two to this Moriola, do you notice something interesting there? Normally, when cells divide, this cell would have been the size of the two of them together, right, filling the zone of Pellucid. When it divides, it should then go back to its original size and be twice as big. But you notice it's no bigger than when it was one cell. This is like cutting up a pie. You take a pie that's, say, 10 inches across, and you cut it once, you have two pieces half size. Cut it again, four pieces fourth size. That's what's going on here. And if that didn't go on, it'd be pretty much the end of life. Why? It would clog the oviduct. Oh, boy. The Lord really must know what he's doing, huh? Well, uh, here we are at four and a half to five days, and the bowel of cells called the morula is now called a blastocyst because it has a kind of a cyst or fluid inside. And this is an important structure. You should learn the name blastocyst if you don't know it. Here it is, early blastocyst stage. Uh, the cells that are going to form the baby are here, called the inner cell mass. So these are the cells used as embryonic stem cells when people do that kind of a monstrous thing. You're wondering if this is going to form or is forming the baby, what are all these cells out here in the wall of this hollow ball? They're the trophoblast cells. I guess you've forgotten. You need to come up with a placenta, too. It isn't enough to come up with the baby. You have to have the placenta. In fact, you need to get the placenta going a little ahead of the baby so as the baby develops, it's ready for it. So uh, this is what actually implants in the wall of the uterus. Uh, it's pretty tiny. Uh, people say, how could God be concerned about anything this small? You couldn't really call it a human being if it's that small. Uh, look, here it is on the point of a pin. That's tiny. And as you know, God doesn't love little people as much as big people. It's pretty much all a matter of... No, it isn't. In fact, Job asks an interesting question. Hey, it's not just size. Job says, what is man that you, God, should exalt him, that you should set your heart on him, that you should visit him every morning and test him every moment? What is man indeed except that God has created us and chosen to love us? Love us in a way that parental love doesn't even compare. Well, back to our week here. And Here's the implantation event at five and a half to six days. So it's really not until this is completed that the modern dictionary definition of fertilization or conception would say that conceptions occurred. The morning after pills, which were first made available in 2006, uh, can work anywhere along here. And yet the federal government has de declared that this is not conception. It's not conception until implantation. Implantation begins at about five and a half to six days, isn't really complete till about nine days. You basically bought nine days after fertilization that you can claim uh, you're not interfering with conception. Well, this is the way the blastocyst looks as it penetrates through the uterine wall. This is an amazing thing in its own right that the uterine wall would even allow this penetration. Uh, but it does, after all, this is foreign tissue. This is not part of the mother's body. If it was, there'd be no problem here. But it's as different from its mother as you are from your mother. Uh, this tissue should be rejected. The uh, uterus is immune competent. It isn't like it isn't able to respond to foreign material. But in a very complex way, uh, this placenta, uh, or these placental cells uh, that are just beginning to form, are allowed to penetrate. And it's the syncytial trophoblast that does the penetration here. These are really invasive, almost like cancer cells. They just burrow right through that uterine wall. Remember, the cells here in blue are actually forming the baby. Uh, well, here's the placenta. People want to know uh, what I think is the most amazing organ in the whole body. I get asked that question. You know, what's the best evidence for creation in the human body? <laughs> I give it this business. I go, actually, I would say contemplating my navel. <laughs> and they say, what? Yeah, the umbilicus. There used to be an umbilical cord that came out there and it went to the placenta. Let me tell you about it. <laughs> what does it do? Let's start out easy. I'll tell you what it doesn't do and you can be pretty sure it does everything else. It's not a brain. It's not a central nervous system. It doesn't serve those functions. And it's not a heart. And if you think about it, it's the heart 
and the central nervous system that is the earliest to develop in the developing embryo. Very precocious. Well, uh, just give you a short list of what it does do. It is a lung. A baby can actually be born with no lungs and survive until you take the placenta away. I said that in the museum here a couple of months ago and a couple started crying. They had a baby that that was the situation. They knew the day that baby was, would be delivered would be its last day on Earth because the lungs failed to develop. But it was doing basically fine until you take the placenta away. It's a lever. In fact, it's all the digestive glands of the body. It's the complete GI tract. All this with the help of the mother. Uh, the placenta is the urinary system. Uh, the placenta is the whole endocrine system. In fact, it's more than just the placenta. <laughs> the baby's involved in this, too, and so is the mother. There are biochemical pathways where one step occurs in the mother, one in the baby, and one in the placenta, all three working together in concert. You almost can't separate the three. They're like one entity at this point. Uh, and it's a protector of the body. Uh, it affords uh, uh, the uh, arrival uh, from the mother of uh, antibodies and uh, other things. Well, here's kind of the whole sequence in the development of the placenta. It's kind of complicated. This would be the uterine wall. The blue and yellow is the baby. You can see it's just sort of getting started here. Uh, the green is the cytotrophoblast. And here the cells will fuse to form syncytial trophoblasts. So there'll be many, many nuclei that'll be in one cell. And that cell's invasive. It penetrates through the wall. And it comes upon the blood vessels that are in the wall of the uterus of the mother. And there it actually erodes the blood vessels, just cuts the end off. It's like taking a garden hose and cutting it off. Boy, the water's going everywhere, except the placenta seals it in. And the blood comes to flow into little channels or lacuna uh, that are within this seamless syncytial trophoblast. So it gets captured in these little spaces, not allowed to escape. Baby is continuing to develop as the placenta is. Uh, here, if we move on to the 11-day uh, embryo, we can see these lacuna are starting to kind of coalesce, and we're getting uh, sort of uh, syncytial trophoblast enclosed areas containing blood that develop all the way around the developing baby. Uh, if we move on to uh, 14 days, you begin to see the placenta as a structure that goes all the way around, not just on one side the way it is at birth. In fact, here's a picture of a 40-day uh, embryo, and you can see the placenta goes all the way around the baby. Sort of looks like cotton candy, doesn't it, the placenta? It has these little filamentous frilly things here. Uh, you can think of those as being like a bunch of little trees. I put in one tree there in yellow. Uh, when the baby's born, the placenta has about 20 of these. We call them cotyledons. Uh, the crown of the little tree is about the size of a marble. And if you look at the placenta, when it unplugs, you can see the lumpy cotyledons there. And each of them has essentially one trunk. And the tips kind of anchor in the uterine wall uh, of the mother. Uh, so uh, let's uh, look at... Uh, one of the tips of the very branches of one of these trees, I took this picture with a scanning electron microscope more years ago than I'm going to admit, except I will tell you this. It was the first scanning electron micrograph ever published to show that these little tiny twigs or villi uh, on the ends of the branches of the tree had little tiny processes called microvilli that even further increased their surface area. If you make a cross-section through that little uh, uh, villus there, and look at it in a microscope, uh, the blood you see inside here, that's all baby's blood. So that red blood cell belongs to the baby. That white blood cell belongs to the baby. Where's mother's blood? It's like the wind blowing through this little grove of 20 trees. It's outside the twig. So this red blood cell belongs to mom. That white blood cell belongs to mom. And in between the two is this pink line. And that pink line is this syncytial trophoblast that I was telling you where all the cells keep fusing and fusing and fusing. This becomes the biggest cell in the body. As far as we know, the whole surface of the placenta, this pink layer out here, is one cell. And if you could flatten it out in one sheet instead of being like bark and 20 trees, <laughs> if you could flatten it out in one sheet, it'd be the size of a living room area rug, 8 by 11 feet. Seamless with mother's blood on one side and baby's blood on the other. Well, it really gets interesting from here, all the things this placenta is doing. Many things can go passively across the placenta, water, uh, oxygen, following a concentration gradient. 
Other things have to be transported. For example, glucose is a major energy source. Uh, it needs a transport mechanism to get the glucose from mother's blood to baby's blood. Uh, amino acids are transported by a facilitated transport mechanism. And uh, some things have to go across the placenta that the placenta is completely impermeable to, one of which is iron. The baby has to make its own blood because the two bloods never mix. But to make the blood, the baby needs to make hemoglobin. To make hemoglobin, it needs to make the porphyrin ring. To make the porphyrin ring, it needs iron. No iron, no blood, no baby. And iron doesn't cross the placenta. Anyone see any problem here? <laughs> it's over. It wouldn't make any difference how good your uh, brain had developed, or your kidney, or liver. I mean, no blood, you're not alive. Simple as that. So how does iron get across? Well, there's many transport proteins uh, that are important for bringing things across the placental barrier, one of which is transferrin. It's a big protein, 670 amino acids long. So think of a string of beads, 670 long, made up of 20 different kinds of beads, say 20 different colors. So at each of the 670 positions, it could be any one of 20, okay? How many strings of beads could you make that differ differed by one bead? In the case of hemoglobin, it's been estimated the total number of ways of putting it together, if you start with the right proportions of all the amino acids, is 1 times 10 to the 600th power. That's 1 with 600 zeros after it. 1 times 10 to the 80th, infinitely smaller number, is believed to be approximately the number of atomic particles in the known universe. And if you put one more zero after it, make it 81, it's 10 times bigger. This is 1 times 10 to the 600th power, and transferrin is bigger than hemoglobin. How's dumb luck working for you so far? <laughs> so it gets across. Well, this is the way the placenta looks at term. It unplugs from the uterine wall, comes out as the afterbirth. This, by the way, is the worst wound any human being ever gets and lives to tell the story. Approximately a dozen blood vessels, a little smaller than a soda straw get truncated when the placenta unplugs. All of the blood of the mother goes through the placenta at term every 10 minutes. This means when the placenta unplugs, there should be total ensanguination of the mother in 10 minutes. That's a serious problem. What would a surgeon do? He'd start getting the hemostats and clamping as quick as he could on his vessels, trying to save the life. What does God do? He builds a hemostat into every single artery and vein. So when the placenta unplugs, the vessels kind of break along a dotted line so that the sphincter, a little muscular sphincter, goes with mother, not with the baby's side. It immediately clamps down, and instead of losing all the blood of the mother in 10 minutes, maybe a cup of blood is lost in a normal pregnancy. How's dumb luck working for you? Uh, here you can see the trees. They're upside down. The trunk is up here. The blood kind of sprays into the trees, like taking a hose and going into a bush. And... Uh, there are three blood vessels running through the umbilical cord. Uh, they're not the right color according to what you'd expect. The red one's the vein, the two blue ones are the arteries because it's unoxygenated blood coming from the baby's heart to the placenta. reason there's two vessels, it comes out of vessels going into the legs, or two legs, two vessels coming out. There's one placenta normally, and so one vessel is returning oxygenated blood to the baby. Well, here's seven weeks of development. This is what we'd call the end of the embryo period. It magically changes its name uh, to a, uh, a fetus at the eighth week. Uh, at this stage, 99% of all the muscles are present in the body in a very small form, of course. The milk teeth begin to appear. There's detectable brain activity. And uh, here you can see that wonderful umbilical cord. By the way, I don't know if you've ever squeezed an umbilical cord, but it's fun. It's really rubbery. And there's a tissue in there called Wharton's jelly. Oh my goodness, no Wharton's jelly, no people. You see, as the moms can tell you, six, seven months, these kids start doing what? Wingovers and loop-de-loops and other aerobatic maneuvers inside the womb. And you could kink that umbilical cord were it not for the fact you've got this extraordinary springy Wharton's jelly that appears nowhere else in the body. Here's a 12-week fetus here, a little later. This is definitely into the fetal range, no longer an embryo. Uh, at eight weeks, we call it a fetus because everything is pretty much completed as far as its initial structure. There's a lot of maturation that has to go on. I have a model of a 12-week fetus here. So this is how big the baby is up there. 
at 12 weeks. Uh, it has fingerprints and nails, facial expressions, fine hair in its face, swallows, responds to touch, grasps objects put in its hand and sucks its thumb. It looks a lot like a baby to me. Well, here we are at the end of the whole process. Everything went well. That's wonderful. It doesn't have to always, but it did here. The baby's in the proper position. It won't be born breached. The umbilical cord is not kinked. Everything looks fine, but there's a big problem. Oh, is there a big problem? Have you heard about the guy that built a boat in his basement and didn't measure the size of the door? <laughs> that happens to be the problem here. You see, here's the doorway. The baby's head fits in here quite nicely, but the outlet end is sort of like a, a broad funnel like this. In males, it's like this. You never get a baby through. Females, it's a broader cone, but a baby's head still won't fit through that far end, not because soft tissue's in the way. Bone is in the way. Well, you're ready for another miracle. At each of these joints, this is a famous sacroiliac joint here and here, and here at the pubic joint, uh, the ligaments that hold those bones together soften up. They don't dissolve completely, but they soften up so the bones can spread just enough that the baby's head makes it through if you turn it 90 degrees. Well, you weren't going to get to this lecture without hearing about my grandson, Hayden. Uh, he's at Lutheran South right now in uh, St. Louis. Uh, he was born uh, two months premature. Here he is weighing two pounds, four ounces in the neonatal intensive care unit. And boy, I'll tell you, if you spend any time around a neonatal intensive care unit, you really appreciate a well baby. Uh, a lot of kids didn't make it that were in there with him, but he did. He's doing pretty well. Uh, seven months, that's a good uh, point for us to kind of break away and, and consider Elizabeth and Mary when they met. Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist, who was about seven months, same as my grandson Hayden. And here's an interesting comment that Elizabeth made to Mary. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ear, the babe leaped for joy. Now, we know babies kick in the womb, but this is scripture. John the Baptist leaped for joy at the sound of his Savior's mother's voice. Oh my, what do babies know? Are they as totally tuned out as we sometimes think they are, even if God chooses to speak to them? I think not. Well, it's not enough to be born once. You've seen a marvelous birth process here, but boy, it is nothing compared to the second birth. That's the real miracle. Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, and Jesus answered and said, him, said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I mean, even if you could do that, what would it accomplish? You put a living person in, a living person comes out, that's not birth. But in baptism, we share in Christ's death. We die with him. And through faith... And the word we are reborn again and sent off in a whole new direction. An enemy of God now becomes a dear son. That's more profound than anything we've talked about up until now. I think I'll just leave you with that. Uh, this lecture is available, fearfully and wonderfully made. The version I gave is in this set of DVDs up here called The Sanctity of Life. Uh, it should be available out there. Tommy Mitchell, George Perdom, and I put together a whole thing here that deals with cloning and uh, genetic manipulation and what have you. Uh, you can pick up the individual uh, DVDs if you prefer them that way. Uh, otherwise, I just thank you for your kind attention. I appreciate it.